transport system can contribute dramatically to this problem and so on. So, this is not a normal problem that can be solved by elites, by the top-down power structure and its rationality. We all have to own the climate problem. We all have to own the climate solutions that we have, by the way. We have serious solutions that can solve this problem. So this love letter is an invite to all of you to work together with us in the climate justice space, in the movement, to tackle this very scary, big existential challenge. The second aspect of this love letter is a question. It's a question I want you to reflect on and think about. Because there's a love triangle that this love letter is speaking to. A naughty love triangle. Another third party in the mix. So who is this third party in this love triangle that I want you to think about? And this love letter is trying to kind of eclipse this third party. Well, this third party, many of you love this third party. This third party basically gives you incentives, uh, gives you salaries and wages, uh, it gives you glitz and glamour, infotainment on demand. Uh, yeah, it even wants to take your life world and shape it for you. It wants to even inhabit your dreams and desires. This third party simply is capitalism, capitalism, okay? So I'm saying to you today and through this book, I want you to ask and reflect on this question. Does capitalism love you? It's a very serious question, okay? Most of us go through life not even thinking about the social reality we are located in, we inhabit, we coexist with, and so on. So I need you to reflect on this question, and this book is provoking you to ask this question. Does capitalism love you? Now, the other important theme in this book is that, well, it's not biography or autobiography. It's not memoir. Uh, this is a book that emerged in the context of COVID-19. Uh, and basically, in May, I think it was 2022, I got a COVID infection. Many people ended up on ventilators. I ended up in the emergency room. My body was convulsing. I was paralyzed in my feet and my hands. Uh, my body was just in pain, it was inflamed. And they didn't know what to do with me. They didn't have any solution, okay? But what COVID was doing was exploiting a weakness in my body and it triggered an extreme autoimmune response. And so I was bedridden for two months and then subsequently again, two moments of being bedridden. And so it's been a recurring problem and I've reached a serious biophysical limit in my life. But being in bed all this time with this problem, forced me to reflect on my life. So what the hell have I been doing on this planet amongst you? <laughs> and that's when I started thinking about, you know, the school boycott in 1980 and I was 11 years old, being part of an Italian Congress in Peter Maritzburg, a student leader, joining the Sartre's think tank at a very critical moment in our transition in the early 90s to deracialize and dismantle one of the most gendered and racist labor markets in the world, uh, being at the center of the Communist Party at a very pivotal moment uh, in the transition, but also journeying beyond it and working deliberately and consciously in grassroots communities for a long time, and fomenting a whole host of campaigns that can do a different kind of politics. So all of this flashed before me, and I said, okay, uh, I need to put this together. Because on this journey, I've been trying to imagine a new politics for the country. And so what you have here, this big strange thing, um, it's like a, I don't know, doorstop or something, is 
his 27 years of writing. Writing around these moments and writing around our realities in South Africa and confronting those realities with different possibilities. Uh, there was an alternative to a neoliberal trajectory in South Africa and those debates happened inside the Communist Party. And some of us led those debates because we knew that the choices being made were wrong. That they were choosing to deeply globalize this country, which would bring more pain. Our industrial base would shrink, etc., etc. So one of the first critiques against neoliberalism in the country from the left is in this book. Okay? It was a part not taken. Critiques against zoomification Battles inside the Communist Party, sharp battles inside the Communist Party, which some of us stood up around and said no to zoomification. So those writings are in here as well. Part not taken, of course. Uh, they took him to Polakwane eh? and they took him into power for 10 years and we've lived through that. And so on. So this book is, if you like, part of the hidden archive of the left in South Africa. One small part of it. Many of you don't know about the debates that were happening inside. It draws the curtain. It allows you to go inside to get a feel for the contestations, the battles that were going on to determine the future of this country. And these were very serious battles. It's also an archive of a defeated left. A left that, if you like, uh, did not affirm its futures for South Africa. Okay? And futures in terms of having answers to the problems we face. This is a left that has never had its moment. We've never had a left party in this country. Okay? This is a left that has not been able to shape the destiny of this country. So, this book essentially comes out of that process. And as I said, it's not memoir, it's not autobiography, but it does have an introduction that situates these writings. There are three, oh, maybe I should say one other thing. Um, as I was thinking about this project, um, I was contacted by an international publisher called Brill. They have a critical social studies series, um, and they're putting and curating the thought of critical thinkers in different parts of the world. And they asked me if I could put my writings together, and I was like so excited because here's me in my bed and thinking about my life. And here's an international publisher that wants to put some of this work together. So, when I was compiling all of this, uh, it came to about 1,500 pages. And, uh, well, <laughs> I had to cut it down. So, Brill is actually putting out an online version of this book, which will be around 700 or something pages, which will be open access and available to the world. In a year's time, they'll publish it in the United States uh, through Haymarket Books. But what you have in front of you is an abridged version of that bigger book that Jakana Press has put out for a South African audience. Now, there are three themes or threads that run through this work. The first theme is around explaining the crisis of national liberation politics. So we've had 30 years of democracy, but there are very, very serious questions about this democratic process and project that require us to confront. They require an honest and genuine reckoning if we are going to move forward as a society. There are hard truths that we have to come to terms with around where our country has gone and is going. So mainstream explanations of all of this, largely liberal, will tell us South Africa is failing because of crime. South Africa is failing because of Zuma. South Africa is failing because of the ANC. Of course, these are important factors or conditions that are fed into the South African crisis. But these single factor explanations are not enough. We need to understand the lives of the many, of the workers, of the poor, of the marginal, the wretched, the subaltern, if you like, uh, in terms of what has gone wrong here. You've got to look at what's gone wrong from that perspective, from that, that if you like, social location. So, very simply, the book has an opening, you know, 
about 60 people that got mowed down and shot for 1960. But in the post-apartheid period, over 140 people were killed in the life of SED men in tragedy, okay, under ANC rule. It's an example of how the life of the many under apartheid didn't matter. In the post-apartheid period under ANC government, the life of the many still doesn't matter. There's a reading in here also about Marikan and the brutal killing of those workers, okay. So this is the issue we've got to wrestle with. We've got to explain this. And we can't explain this in these narrow ways. So this book offers a concept called the passive revolution. This is not counter-revolution where there's physical violence and liquidation of left forces and so on. The concept of passive revolution comes from an Italian social thinker, Marxist, called Antonio Gramsci. And he was put in prison in 1926 by Mussolini. Mussolini's children are now in power in Italy. But what Gramsci was grappling with was the defeat of the left, the long defeat of the left. Uh, particularly in the conjuncture of crisis uh, and after World War I. We have to think about this question of the defeat of the left in South Africa. But we need to do it in a way that brings things into a holistic perspective. We need to think about the historical process we've been through from a holistic perspective. And the different relations that are implicated in that process. We need to think about how accumulation and class formation happened here. We need to think about state formation. We need to think about state civil society relations. We need to think about international relations, the national liberation block of forces and how it's unraveling. And we need to think about the left response. So what this book offers, if you like, is this holistic analysis of three decades of democracy and what went wrong. But not looking at just narrowly single factor things, but looking at the totality of relations implicated in the society. The second theme holding this book together is the theme of polycrisis. Now since the French Revolution of 1789, we've had over 200 years of rule by capital, by capitalists, okay? But that form of rule has given us wars, has given us economic crisis, has given us hunger, has given us inequality, has given us deep social alienation. It has given us, in essence, four great polycrises. From the late 19th century, the interwar years, the 70s, circa the two, middle 2000s till the present. The current crisis, which is the fourth great crisis of capitalism, threatens to wipe out human and non-human life. And there's various dynamics to this. Resource peak, biodiversity loss and disasters, climate change, criminalized market democracies that are increasingly becoming authoritarian and neo-fascist and so on. And so this is the spot crisis that has to be tackled systemically. We are still in the epoch of strategic politics. We cannot tackle the crisis we live in through symbolic politics, just showing up at a protest and putting up a placard. We cannot solve this problem just by lobbying these criminalized elites. This is a problem that requires, again, the renewal of strategic subjectivity, strategic politics. And again, this is one of the arguments of this book. And finally, this book is about left renewal. How do we ensure that the left comes back and has a place in shaping society and shaping our future? I don't believe in the old left of the 20th century, if you like, the reformist left or the revolutionary left. The reformist left did not confront the great crises of capitalism. Even when capitalism was at its weakest, it did not do this. It largely associated with the social democratic tradition. Its pragmatic gradualism could not meet the moment. And it cannot meet the moment we are living through now. It is not up to the task. Revolutionary politics in the classical mode has been millenarian, 
extolling the virtues of violence, bringing chaos, and inviting counter-revolution. The basic premise of this politics is that things must be made worse, and made worse, and made worse. Now, I don't think this is a rational politics for our time, and we are in a deep crisis. So we need a post-national liberation, post-Soviet, and post-social democratic left politics. We need a politics that brings back the left identity that is grounded in belief. The left has always had an identity grounded in a thought position. Okay? And this means it has to be defined by four things, and I'll end. It has to be defined by how we understand capitalism and its crisis. We need to have an analysis of the crisis we live in. That must define who you are as the left. We need to learn lessons from the past. We have a long tradition of left politics. In the 20th century, we had Soviet socialism, we had social democracy, we had revolutionary nationalism. Each of these projects were important, they had emancipatory aspirations, but they also reached limits. They faced contradictions. They were exhausted. They were defeated for various reasons. We need to draw lessons from these traditions as well, as part of building this identity of a transformative left. The third important thing is we need this new strategic politics. As I've been saying, since the Paris Commune of 1870 till now, we've had two ideas that have informed strategic thinking of the left. The idea that the workers occupy a strategic place in economies. They are at the point of production. And that was a crucial pillar of strategic politics of the left. The other pillar was the idea of capitalism's crisis. The former pillar is much weakened today because of globalized capitalism. But the second pillar of strategic politics of the left, crisis, is still with us. And it has to guide how we think a new transformative politics. Fine, and, and that means, and this book argues for the idea of democratic systemic reforms. And we can talk more about this idea. And finally, a new transformative left identity has to be very clear about what it stands for. What is it fighting for? It has to be clear about its ethics of care. You know, the revolutionary tradition eschewed, it rejected ethics. It was wrong. It had what was called a consequential ethics. Any ends justify the means, even famines and gulags and so on. No, the 21st century left has to ground its politics an ethics of care, of love, of solidarity, and freedom. Very, very important. The second thing is systemic alternatives. As I said, we have answers. In South Africa, we can end the unemployment problem with climate jobs. And we've done the research on this. We've done the modeling on this. We can end hunger through food sovereignty. We can provide a basic income grant to the society through a wealth tax, and so on. They are very, very serious systemic alternatives that can make this a caring society, a better society. And basically what this means is that we need to bring back left agency. I've spent 27 years of my life um, contributing to this project, and I hope to engage you further tonight. Thank you.